Good morning. Good morning. I'm first, but first of all, I want to thank the, the, the institution, University of Minnesota, and all the organizers for allowing the community of Rondo to be a part of this very, very important program. I'm very honored to be here and to share a panel with such distinguished speakers. So I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit of story about the community of Rondo. Rondo in St. Paul, Minnesota. I call it Atonement and Reconciliation, the Rondo community, 50 years and counting. Um, our story begins with the whole idea of freeways. 1949, the United States embarked on a, a freeway uh, mania campaign that was spurred on perhaps by General Dwight D. Eisenhower on his return from the European Theater of Operations, having seen how the Autobahn system in Germany was used to transport men and munitions throughout Germany, wide roads with unlimited speed limits, and coming back to the United States and being involved in the development of the Cold War with the Russia Eisenhower and other highway planners had decided that one way in which we might be able to counteract that is to build a system of roads throughout the United States that would be able to move men and munitions, but also to stop traffic jams and business. But there was a military background to the whole freeway movement. And actually, the first freeway act had a, a defense background. So the city of St. Paul, uh, in 1935, in order to give you some background, you really can't see that as much as I would like for you to see, but that was by a demographer for the city of St. Paul. Back in 1935, they divided the city of St. Paul up into some sections, and the sections were given names by the demographer. In the lower right, lower left-hand corner, that's called the Gold Coast. That's the area now around Highland Park where the Ford plant lives. A little bit above that in the Prospect Park area is an area called uh, working, working men's homes. And then as you move forward into the center of the map, you see some large kind of brown areas. Those were called slums. And those slums were identified in particular ways on this side, it was slums, it was called Mexicans and Jews and Italians. In another section, it was Jews and Mexicans. And as you go above the Gold Coast, that large hump there is the slum of Rondo, St. Paul's largest slum area. And that was in 1935, and it's ironic, our research has found a newspaper around 1935 in the black press and at the same time, the city of St. Paul was creating this slum area of Rondo. The community of Rondo was hosting an expo and 55 inventors, salespeople, and people in business were holding an expo at the Welcome Hall. In the following week newspaper, the story read that that expo was fantastic many inventions were sold, the people had a great time. So that dichotomy between what the community outside of us saw and what the community of Rondo was actually engaged in had been created as far back as 1935. Uh, to be very, there's a lot of history, but I wanna break it down because we don't have, I don't have that much time. The decision came down between whether or not the freeway was gonna go through the middle of Rondo, or it was going to take the northern route. Now the northern route, if you know this area, is Pierce Butler Road. Pierce Butler Road was the northern route where it was an abandoned railroad line. Very few homes, very little businesses was created there, as opposed to going through the Rondo St. Anthony route, which would wipe out over 800 homes, 850 homes, and about 125 businesses. The highway system, as identified from 1949 to 1968, wiped out about 1,600 predominantly African-American communities. 
It's been called the largest, uh, the largest effect on African American communities where over one million people were, were moved or displaced by the highway department. And even though someone has said we only had about 11,000 Negroes in St. Paul, somehow they still found us. And that's exactly what had happened. Dr. Mindy Fullalove, who's an urban psychiatrist, is the person who has registered the 1,600 African American communities that were affected, destroyed, or displaced by freeways. And she has written a book called Root Shock, R-R-O-T, Shock, which is a, a shock to the ego system of an individual. Uh, she considers that what happened to those communities that were affected by freeways as a shock to their personal systems of those communities that have resulted in many, many years of depression. She, she considers it like a severe burn that even though it's healed, the pain of that burn, we can call it an amputation. Your community is destroyed, it is displaced. People are th th dispersed throughout a community that is hostile. And no matter how long or how long this goes on, that hurt, that community, that displacement stays with you. And that the community was like any other African American community. It had their Masonic Lodge that had so many things for children. Uh, it had a group of men. That, it was a primarily a community of waiters, porters, red caps, maids, barbers, beauticians. Jobs that were considered menial by the outside community, but within our community, those people who held those jobs had great respect. We had great respect for them. They were our exalted rulers. They were the deacons of our churches. They were the, the women, the men and the women that ran our scout groups. These were individuals that we all looked up to, and we all had great affinity for them. We had drum corps. We had baby showers. We had everything that any other community had, but yet from 1935, they said this was a slum. And when you designate it as a slum, so many things can happen to you. I put that picture up here because in 1952, right before the freeway had its major effect, that's a graduating class from the John Marshall High School of 1952 oh. I put it up there because every one of those graduates went on to college and had advanced degrees. One of them, a top row, second in from your left, was a man named Leo Lewis from the Lewis family in St. Paul. And the name may not mean much, doesn't probably mean much to anybody in this room, but to the city of Winnipeg and to the Canadian Football League, Leo Lewis is the all-time leading rusher of the Canadian Football League, and Bud Grant, who became a legend here for the Minnesota Vikings, said, I would never have had this job had it not been for the rushing titles that Leo Lewis brought to the Winnipeg Bombers when I was their coach. We had our weddings, and then, again, what happened was the mayor of St. Paul was given a choice. And that choice was depicted in this cartoon, which would you prefer? Development or slum clearance? And the choice was made. St. Paul was destroyed. The Rondo community was destroyed when that choice was made based upon a recommendation that had been in his mind and in the minds of St. Paul people for many years ahead. And there it was. That happened for, started in 1958, and it was the longest stretch of freeway construction because it wasn't finished until 1968. And during that time, the community of Rondo was in distress. There was I-94 as it looked at the completion of the freeway, Rondo Avenue is right in the center of that, that picture. 
that was the economic, the social hub of the community of Rondo. But thanks to Dr. Fuller Love in 19, 2015, we decided that it was time to have what we consider to be a remembrance and a reconciliation and a restoration ceremony. The community of Rondo had been in such pain since the destruction of Rondo that it was Dr. Fuller Love who came here at, at our invitation and in February of 2015, she held a lecture in St. Paul and she said that your pain that you're carrying is tantamount to taking poison and hoping somebody else may die. You have to relieve your community of this pain. You have to atone. You have to move on. You have to tell your community that it is time to find what was good and move beyond this, this pain that was brought upon you. And it was through her work and the three days that she spent with us that at Rondo Avenue, Inc., we decided to hold what we consider to be a restoration and an atonement ceremony. We asked our elders, we had three elders over the age of not 100 to write on a piece of paper what their pain was from Rondo. What was the thing about the destruction of Rondo that meant most to them? And then we burned these in an urn. And what happened after that was remarkable. The, the, the chairman, the commissioner of the Department of Transportation rose and said that on behalf of, this, of, the, state of, Saint, of the state of Minnesota, he apologized. He made a formal apology to the community of Rondo and said that knowing what they know now, there was no way that the community of Rondo should have been targeted by that freeway construction. The mayor of the city of St. Paul apologized for the decision to do slum clearance or value homes or property over people. And as a result of that atonement, of their atonement, of our forgiveness, of that time that we spent together in 2016, we broke ground on what we consider to be the, the Rondo Commemorative Plaza. And that plaza was based, was found, was located on the last building that was standing in the old Rondo neighborhood, a building that was built in two, 1917. It was destroyed by fire in 2013. And that being the last physical structure, we built our plaza, the Rondo Commemorative Plaza. Uh, to give you an idea of where it is, there's I-94 as it is right now, and there's the Victoria Street Bridge in St. Paul. There is the Rondo Commemorative Plaza, and there is a, a building that we were just able to purchase last month where we will now have an indoor option for the plaza. In July of this year, we had a grand opening of the Rondo Commemorative Plaza, and there it stands now. Uh, there is a 40-foot high marker with the name Rondo that you can actually see that from the freeway. And on the very top is a, a cube that after four attempts will be lit tomorrow evening at 5.30 and it will flash red, white, and blue. We're having the, an opening tomorrow. There is the plaza that we have uh, built. Uh, it has both a uh, exhibit panels on the left there is a wind chime, that, those are the streets of Rondo. There it is lit at night. And we were just informed that Minnesota Architectural Magazine has selected the Rondo Commemorative Plaza as the outstanding public space in the state of Minnesota for this year. The Rondo Commemorative Plaza is the anchor or the beginning of a renaissance and a restoration of the Rondo community that we are now extending into what we call the Rondo Land Bridge Project. 
a, a land bridge is an actual construction and the creation of land over a freeway. Is my time up? Okay, <laughs> that me? <laughs> I'll finish in. <laughs> the, uh, the land bridge, there is uh, an example of what a land bridge is, what can do, and there is an example of what the Rondo land bridge will look like. Uh, we recreate the street of a Rondo Boulevard. Those buildings, those flower markets, those open air are actually built over I-94 in the Rondo community. It is not the first land bridge in the United States. In fact, there are well over 30 land bridges in the United States that are in creation right now. This is not a new technology, but it will be a new, a new use because our land bridge not only will be a, a center for uh, affordable housing, the incubator space, but it will also contain a permanent monument, cultural monument to what happened to Rondo with the Cultural Museum and Educational Center. But I want to be sure that you understand in context of this meeting that no matter how we feel about that land bridge and we, uh, uh, how we feel about the Rondo Commemorative Plaza and the land bridge, no matter how much money was spent to create that, that the African-American presence in America had been going on now for 400 years and counting. And in that 400 years and counting, the, the relationship between the men and women of African descent and those who have created a culture of white supremacy has been a tension and a prolonged struggle that a land bridge, uh, commemorative plaza is really, really, a, really a drop and a huge bucket of what has happened and what has been taken away from the people of this community. Our relationship has given, well, given rise to things like Jim Crow words, poll tax, voter registration, voter suppression, Jim Crow, redlining, discrimination, back of the bus, uh, housing discrimination, slum, disinvestment, displacement, shrinkage. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And there will never be an opportunity for this country to repay the people, not just the African American people, but the Native Americans and all the people who have been destroyed by this policy of white supremacy. A, a, a policy that is designed to, to, to to rape, when I heard someone speak the other day, they're bringing rapists, they're bringing murderers, they're trying to invade our country. I wanted to say, that sounds like the Native Americans when, when the people first came to America. They could have said the very same thing. So as much as we are and happy about the Rondo Land Bridge, we are aware that it's been 400 years, and in 2019, it will be the 400th anniversary of the arrival of African slaves at Jamestown. And we have joined the movement to call upon all families and organizations and neighborhoods to observe this anniversary by telling their story of oppression and resistance. Nearly 400 years of divisions have created an apartheid society. We need a new social infrastructure to carry us through the challenges of climate change, decaying physical and structure, rapidly involving jobs, underperforming schools, and uneven access to health care and the lack of affordable housing. We offer the opportunity to link arms with any organization, any individuals that would like to be involved in this observance. The Rondo Commemorative Plaza will be open on the week of, the week of, I think it's going to be October the 16th through October the 27th. The Rondo Commemorative Plaza will be hosting an opportunity for people to come and be involved in this tremendous opportunity to to look at our 400 years here, to look at what we have in common with other oppressed groups and work together to restore America to live out its promise 
that it has in its constitution. Thank you so much for your attention.